Does it work? Maybe better? Ah, okay. The problem we want to solve is a problem in obstruction theory. We want to prove that the semi-regularity map annihilates obstruction to immersive deformations. And everything in this talk will be on the field of complex number. And I need a preliminary remark, which is the following. But there is also, I guess the answer is yes, as always. But uh, I would not be able to prove this without working on C. And the reason is because uh, I will work with uh, smooth differential forms uh, and uh, distributions. So as long as one is able to do every, every construction I do here with some other resolution of the sheaf of holomorphic function, then I, I, I guess it will work. But I'm not an expert in this technique, so I, I won't try to say anything. So let us begin with the problem. The problem is just this. We have some x is some smooth complex manifolds, and we have um, a submanifold inside it. And then we can consider the infinitesimal deformation of z inside x. And I call this deformation problem Hill xz, since uh, uh, this is essentially the infinitesimal neighborhood of the Hilbert scheme of sub of subschemes of the same type as Z uh, inside X. Uh, so I have a deformation problem, and there are a couple of things that are very well known classically, which is the, the tangent space to infinitesimal deformation of Z inside X. These are just the global section of the normal shift. How do I deform a, an immersive submanifold? I just pick a normal vector field, and I move Z along the normal vector field. And another very classical thing is that the obstruction space for deformation is contained into H1 of the normal uh, bundle. But something more precise can be said about obstructions, namely that the obstructions are contained in the kernel of this map. This is the so-called semi-regularity map. The, the terminology is very classical, dates back to Severi, I guess. Uh, <coughs> I take some element in H1 of the normal, I use the contraction of differential forms against the vector fields, and this gives a well-defined linear map from H1 of the normal bundle over Z to this uh, hypercomology group. H2P of this sort of um, uh, the ram de Lin complex, which is, which is truncated exactly in degree P minus one. And this is called the semi regularity map, and one expects that the obstruction to immersive deformation of Z inside X are killed by this map, so uh, are in the kernel of this map. Uh, this has been originally proven by Bloch with some other technical additional hypotheses, the, essentially the vanishing of a few cohomology groups, and in full generality by Donatella Iacono, who is there, Marco Manetti, and Jonathan Pridham. So what I, I will describe is uh, a, a geometrical meaning of this proof. W what is the geometry behind these proofs? Uh, and actually, geometry will be infinitesimal geometry. We are talking of uh, formal deformation problems, so everything will be infinitesimal. And the idea is that this piece of map, this map here, uh, uh, has, to be, has to be seen as uh, a truncation of some morphism of deformation factors. So, what will be the, what yeah? The, what's the thing, what's the obstruction? Obst, obst are the obstruction. I, yeah. I, I, I want to deform Z inside X. So what's the definition, I mean, is it, what's the definition? Oh, uh, it, it, it will be some subspace, uh, uh, it will be appear formally and uh, clearly in uh, the, in the construction, what is OBS. Oh, okay. But uh, what, uh, <coughs> At this naive level, it, it just means that uh, I have a, some tangent direction 
I, I want to deform z along that direction, uh, but I, I, I'm not sure whether I can do this or not. To what order? To any, to, to all orders? Yes, to, to all orders. So the, it's an abstraction at some order? Yes. So, so uh, and there is some map from the tangent space to some h2, and uh, where do I, I end up with is the observer. Uh, Well, uh, what I'm saying is that there is some map from, uh, let's go back. So, you know, that the abstraction so of the vocation yeah. line is H1. You take the... I know, but is he going to... I, sure, but is yeah. it, what is it, what sort of, is it an algebraic variety? Is it a formal neighbor? I mean, what is it? I just don't understand. I'm trying to follow the talk, and I don't know what all it is. What is this? Should I just think it's something that we all know what it is, or are you going to define it? Oh, no. Well, I, I will have this only for the GLAs, mm -hmm. and the, the aim of the talk is to prove uh, that I can construct a morphism of DGLAs that represents my deformation problem. And then my OBS will be the OBS of the DGLA problem. Th that will be the strategy. Ah, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, in, in a sense. So, so uh, what is the idea? The idea is that I want to realize that part of, uh, of uh, geometrical data as the datum of amorphous of deformation factors. On one side, I have the deformation of Z inside X, and on the other side, I have some other deformation factor, which I just ev evocatively call Jack 2 p because it is somehow related to the intermediate Jacobian, but this will be just uh, a name, a placeholder, for some functor I will construct. And what do I want from this morphism? I want this to reproduce my situation. So I want that the obstructions uh, to this deformation functor are just zero. So this map will map obstruction of this, whatever they are, to obstructions of, of this. And if the obstruction of this are zero, this means that this map will map all obstructions to zero, which is what I want to prove. Well, this map will map obstructions to zero, but I, I do not want that some map maps obstructions to zero. I want that precisely the semi-regularity map does this job. So it is not enough just to ask that we have something like this. I mean, if here I just take the terminal morphisms to the point, that will kill all obstructions, but it will not give me my theorem. So I, I want something more. I want that the obstruction map for this, uh, this transformation of factors is the, is the semi regularity map. So this is what I, I want to, to build up. And as we learned in the previous talk, talking of Infinitesimal deformation functors is just the same thing as talking of differential graded Lie algebras, or more in general of L infinity algebras. So this naive problem has uh, a formal translation, which is oh, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction, which is the following. I want to exhibit some morphism of L infinity algebras from G to H, such that G is the L infinity algebra which governs immersive deformations of Z inside X. I want H to be abelian, or homotopy abelian would be enough. So I w want the target to be just some chain complex. And then I want that the linear morphism between the H2s of these differential Gadli algebras to be identified with the semi-regularity map. So this is the plan. I have to build build phi. If I'm able to build phi with these features, then I'm done. So, first thing I need to talk of are homotopy fibers of DGLA morphisms. So, what are these? I start with a morphism of differential graded Lie algebras, and by definition, the homotopy fiber is some object, which I denote by Ho fiber of chi, uh, which satis uh, resolve some universal problem. The universal problem is to have a pullback up to homotopy with a given homotopy. So this arrow here is part of the data. And 
that object there together with its somotopy is universal when I have this data. So how do I explicitly construct such an object? Well, that is the universal property, but there is a standard way of producing such uh, homotopy fiber. I just replace the initial morphisms 0 to m with some vibration, p to m, with this, which is equivalent to zero, and then I just take the ordinary pullback. Doing this, one obtains what is called the Tom Whitney model, which is just what I've just described here, when one takes us P, just the path object over M. So, this has good features, for instance, is a differential graded Lie algebra, uh, and this is good, because it makes all computation very simple, but it also has uh, some bad features. This is very big, always. Even if uh, uh, L and M are finite dimensional, this object is an infinite dimensional differential graded Lie algebra. And this may be inconvenient. But there is also another model. Well, there are, of course, there are infinitely many models. This is a standard one. There is another standard model, which is, is just as big as L and M. And it is just the cone. The cone from uh, linear algebra. The cone of the morphism sky. The morphism sky, in particular, is uh, a morphism of, of complexes. So I can construct L plus a shift copy of M endowed with the usual differential. And this is a chain complex which represents the homotopy fiber of chi in the category of chain complexes. And then what one shows is that actually that space, that complex, carries a natural L infinity algebra structure that makes it a model for the homotopy fiber of chi. So the the two bracket is just the Lie bracket on L and this mixture of the Lie bracket of M together with the morphisms, and then we have all the other brackets and here is where the Bernoulli number that I was mentioning appear. So this model is convenient because it, it is very small, but we pay having a small model in having infinitely many non-trivial operations. And in this talk, both the models will play a role. So, uh, these are homotopy fibers of DGLE morphisms, and you may be wondering why I'm talking of this, because uh, I was talking of the deformation of Z inside X. And, and the reason is the following. This allows me to exhibit an L-infinity algebra which controls deformations of Z inside X. So oh, let me explain how I arrived to this definition. Well, we have seen in Marco's talk that there is this, yes? Oh, I'm off, off the limit, so inside the limit. Oh, so I have to write there. <laughs> so recall from Marco's talk that this sort of doll body GLA was controlling the deformations of X. So this is deformations of the complex manifold X. And if I consider the sub DGLA of vector fields that are tangent to the submanifold Z, then I can use these vector fields to deform X and to deform Z. So if I consider that, that curve there, which I'm calling a zero star x theta x minus log z. This will control the formations of x and z as a pair. And the inclusion of this inside this is just the forgetful functor from the formations of the pair to the formation of one of the two objects. And now I have these two deformation functors and I can take the fiber. What is the fiber? Well, these are two groupoids. So the fiber will be an object here 
together with a morphism from the image of that object here and the trivial morphism here. So it, it will be a deformation of the pair. I'm deforming both X, the ambient, and Z inside X. But then I'm trivializing, this is the datum of the homotopy, I'm trivializing the deformation of X. So if the deformation of X is not just trivial, it is trivialized, then I can think of this as a deformation of Z inside a fixed X. And this is precisely my field. So I see that at the level of deformation factors, HELB naturally arises as homotopy fiber. It's the homotopy fiber of the forgetful factor from this to this. So I have the DGLAs that control this and this, and then the DGLA controlling this will just be the homotopy fiber of this. So this is how, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, just move? Uh, okay, yes. You are talking about global sections of... Yes, those, those are global. Uh, and I'm in the smooth category. So everything is free infinity. And, and it, well, indeed, you, you can do this also algebraically. What, what, what we have to do is, well, here I'm using this particular DGLA, but this just serves as global sections of some uh, fine resolutions of holomorphic vector fields. So uh, in, the, in the smooth category, I can just take Dolbo, uh, otherwise I just take derived, ho mm, derived sections of the original sheaf, and that will work uh, in uh, an algebraic way. So th these DGLAs here uh, just serve as resolutions of the, the holomorphic path. Okay, so. This solves the, the first step. Uh, remember, this should be enough. I, I want to exhibit some phi from G to H, and okay, this part is solved. I have G. Now I have to construct H and phi. So, okay, this is what I just said. And to construct H and phi, the main technical tool will be something which is called Cartan homotopy. So it starts with just two DGLAs and a morphism of degree minus one, which will not preserve anything. It will not preserve the bracket, but of course, M minus one is not even a DGLA, so it's meaning meaningless to ask that I will preserve a bracket. Uh, it will not preserve neither the differential. It is just a morphism of graded vector spaces. And then I can consider the differential of I in homomorphism from L to M. This is a natural structure of chain complex. The differential is that expression there. And uh, now L will be a morphism of chain complexes between L and M, and I will be a homotopy for this. But here I'm not working with chain complexes. I'm working with differential graded Lie algebras. So there is more structure. And having just this will not be enough to say that I is a homomorphism uh, is a homotopy between L and zero in the category of differential graded Lie algebras. This just tells me that I is a homotopy between L and zero in chain complexes. So I need some additional condition to be able to say that that I is a homotopy between L and zero in differential graded Lie algebras. And uh, the condition I need are just these two very explicit conditions. Uh, I of AB is IA LB and I, IA IB is zero. And this we call uh, Cartan conditions since they just reproduce formally the Cartan identities. And indeed, if you ask me which is an example of Cartan homotopy, well, the prototypical example is just this. You take a uh, smooth manifolds, you consider the Lie algebra of vector fields, you consider differential graded Lie algebra of endomorphisms of differential forms, and you consider the contraction, contraction of uh, differential forms against vector fields. This is a Cartan homotopy, and the identities I need to check are just Cartan identities. 
And this is also a holomorphic version, which is exactly the same thing in which I replace vector fields with precisely, pre precisely this DGLA here. And now the DGLA morphism L, the one I always call the lead derivative, happens to be the holomorphic lead derivative, yes? Yes, that one. Does that mean that it's a derivation with respect to the the algebra structure component? Um, no, I'm not sure. I don't, don't think so. so. This is what happens in associated algebra, homotopic and homomorphic. Oh, I, I had not yeah, thought of that, but we, we we can try to to see later. So. What happens for sure is that I if I start with some i which satisfies this, then L is automatically a DGLA morphism. But then I, I'm not sure L is a derivation. I, I have to think so. Okay, and uh, a further generalization is just going from uh, just differential forms to coherence. Uh, essentially nothing changes, but we will use coherence in the second part of this talk. Okay, but in the title there was uh, a double homotopy fiber, and this means that mm, this means that I have to tell you something before, and this is not very interesting. Neither is this. But first I have to tell you why I'm talking of Cartan homotopies just after I've talked about homotopy fibers. The is that the two are strictly related. So. Just consider a Cartan homotopy from L to M and assume that the image of L, of the lead derivative, just takes values in some sub DGLA. So I'm going in something smaller than M. This I can depict this way. I have I, from I I obtain L, L goes from L to M, but actually factors through some N that embeds into M. And the datum of I was the datum of a homotopy between L and zero. So I have this kind of diagram here. And now, recall that the homotopy fiber had a universal property exactly with respect of diagrams of this kind. So here I have the maps and the homotopy. I need this I here to say that this diagram will naturally induce some diagram of this kind. Now, recall that homotopy fiber is just something which is defined up to natural equivalence. I, I, I just work with different models of this object. And the map phi here will depend on the model. And I've constructed that cone model, because for the cone, the map is the simplest one. Remember, cone was made of two pieces, L and M in degree minus one. And I want to give some L infinity morphism from L to the cone. And this is just L, the degree zero part, and I, the contraction, in degree minus one. This is a linear L infinity morphism from L to the cone of the inclusion. Okay. So, as I was saying two minutes ago, in the title we have double homotopy fibers. And this is because just one homotopy fiber will not be enough. Uh, we need two. And needing two means that we will need not just one Cartan homotopy, but two. And these two will have to be compatible. So we need to have some commutative diagram, strictly commutative, it's a, not homotopy commutative, it's really a strictly commutative, commutative diagram of Cartan homotopies. If I have a diagram of this kind, I can take the lead derivatives and I will get a commutative diagram of uh, DGLA morphisms. And now the assumption to be done, okay. Uh, by naturality, this will of course give uh, Cartan homotopy between the Tom Whitney models. And here is where I use that Tom Whitney was a DGLA model. And and the lead derivative is just a pair of lead derivatives. So, 
Now, let us make the same assumption that I made a minute ago with a single Cartan homotopy for a Cartan square. So, let us assume that both Lie derivatives take values in sub DGLA. So, assume that we have this situation. So, it, it, it becomes to seem something very artificial. But I will show you that this kind of situation is extremely natural. It's extremely simple to build Cartan squares. This is what will make the, the construction, in, in a sense, effective. So, if I have this situation, then what happens? I will have some morphism from the homotopy fiber here, here to the homotopy fiber here, and I will have a morphism from L1 to this homotopy fiber here, L2 to this homotopy fiber here, and then there will be a morphism from the homotopy fiber of this to the double homotopy fiber. This will be the very abstract construction, which then we will have to bring back to geometry. So, the fact that using the cone model, the L infinity morphism was very simple and very explicit. It was just the pair given by the Lie derivative and the Cartan homotopy, allows me to write an explicit linear L infinity morphism from here I take the Tom, Whit Tom Whitney model for this homotopy fiber here, and here I take the cone between the Tom Whitney models. If I use these particular models, then the L infinity morphism is very simple. It's linear. I can use it for computations. Yes? So earlier I would have asked that uh, I didn't uh, ask it now. Is the fact that L comma I is an L infinity morphism yes. obvious, or does it require some little identities on the domain numbers? Oh, no, that's... Uh, let's go in. in, in oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is actually obvious, and, uh, it, well, it, 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 let, let's say it this way, that there must be some L infinity morphisms follows from the universal property. But the fact that there is a, such a simple one is it, it, just a matter of this fact here. You see, here you have IA LB is I of AB, and the commutator of two I's is zero. This means that if you have two i's, uh, let me write it here. If I have i a con i b l c, this will be zero. And now look at the explicit formula for the yeah. for the higher brackets. You see, you have always m's here, and these m's will be the i's. And at the end, you have this chi, and chi will be the L. And so all this will vanish. Uh, it, 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 it is not important that the correct coefficient here. It, it is just this particular identification form that the higher bracket has. Yes? How do you get that back? Oh, this one. Oh, it, it is obtained by from, from this bracket here. So you take the Tom Whitney. That is just a differential graded Lie algebra. And then you use the fact that at the level of chain complexes, the, you have a, an explicit homotopy between the Tom Whitney model and just the cone that, that is here. And the, the, the two maps are just the inclusion of this into the Tom Whitney model and the integration over the simplex. And uh, you then use just um, a homotopy transfer formula. And you transfer the DGLA structure on the Tom Whitney model on an L infinity structure on the con. And you have to do the explicit computation and you find out that bracket there. So I okay. okay, we have this particular L infinity morphism, and having this particular explicit form allows me to make Computations. For instance, what is the H1 of this morphism, or the H2, or in general, what is this morphism in cohomology? This is very simple. I uh, assume that one of the morphisms, uh, the vertical morphisms, phi L and phi M, are inclusions. Then everything drastically simplifies. Since in that case, 
this cone here as a chain complex is quasi isomorphic just to the quotient, shifted by one. And that map there is just a projection on the second factor. And on the right, this quite complicated expression you have here, cone of the tone Witten that goes to the other tone Whitney, is just another quotient. It's M2 modulo the image of M1 and N2. If you recall the commutative diagram, you have inside M2, you have a copy of M1, a copy of N2. You just take their, their sum here, you take the quotient. And that will represent as a chain complex this quite huge expression here. So if I'm interested in cohomological aspects of my morphism, it is just the chain complex structure that matters. And the chain complex structure is just this. So the mysterious L infinity morphism at the level of chain complex is just that. I take some element here in the quotient, I pick up a representative here, and then I take it mod the sum. Okay. So this is the cohomology of my morphism. And now I have to convince you that it is extremely natural to find this, this, this kind of structures, these Cartan squares. And the starting point is just a chain complex. So we start with a chain complex V, and I consider the DGLA of endomorphism of V, and I consider also the affine endomorphism. So one is just the DGLA of GL, and the other one is the DGLA of the affine group. So I admit to have also translations. So very explicitly, this is just endomorphism, the linear transformation part, and a copy of the chain complex V. This is the translation. And as usual with affinities, I identify that DGLA with a sub-DGLA of V extended with a copy of this. Question? No of the scars and the induced brackets are just this. So, what I will use is that endomorphism of V can sit in many ways inside the affinities. I just have to pick a vector V. It will be a degree zero closed vector. And I define JV this way. So the linear part is just the F I take. And then my translation is minus FB. So if I look at the expression for the bracket and the differential, I can see that this JV is actually a DGLA morphism. And it is obviously uh, an injection. But if you ask me, how do you think of this particular, uh, this particular uh, embedding of that DGLA into the affinities, well, this is nothing but the stabilizer of V under the action of the affinities. So just as in linear algebra, you pick a point and you have a copy of GL, which is the stabilizer of that point under affinities. So it is just that. And in particular, when V is zero, this is the canonical embedding of uh, endomorphism. But you have all these others for every V. Uh, you need V to be a uh, degree zero closet element, otherwise it will not work. And another subalgebra you have, you see from this expression, is just V with the zero bracket and its differential. So uh, as in ordinary linear algebra, you will have the exact sequence of digital A's that has V that goes into affinities that projects onto endomorphism. So the right way of thinking of the relation between endomorphisms and affinities is that endomorphisms are a quotient, but they also are uh, a sub DGLA. So this exact sequence splits. Okay. So let us now construct the Cartan homotopy. So we start with a given Cartan homotopy. And then we pick up a closed degree zero vector. And then we define a new Cartan homotopy, which is just the composition of the old one, I, with this JV. 
uh, I've not said, but it's very simple to see that if I have a Cartan homotopy and I pre-compose or post-compose this with a DGLA morphism, what I get is again a Cartan homotopy. So in this case, I start with a Cartan homotopy with values in endomorphism. I pick a close degree zero vector V. I use this vector to define an embedding of endomorphism into affinities. And then the composition will be some Cartan homotopy from my L to affinities. And the corresponding Lie derivative will be just the, the composition. So I have two parts, I have L, and then this evaluation on the particular vector V. Okay, so far, we have built, we have, in, the ingredients are one Cartan homotopy, I, one closed vector, V. Out of this, uh, we have built that Cartan homotopy. This is not enough, because in a Cartan square, I need also another DGLA. So I have to use the same ingredients to exhibit some DGLA. And this is just the elements in L which are killed by I and L. It's a simple exercise to show that this LV is actually a sub-DGLA of L. And it will depend on the, on the vector V I've chosen. So I fix V. And this gives me a lot of data. Gives me the IV and gives me this LV. And then the, the main result is that this is a Cartan square. So I consider the Cartan homotopy IV defined by V. I restrict it to this DGLA LV. And then this is a commutative diagram where here on the right I have no V anymore. Here on the right, I have just the usual inclusion, J0. So this is a Cartan square. And of course, this remains a Cartan square if LV is replaced by any sub-DGLA of LV. So once I have this example, I have plenty of other examples. So now we need the Cartan square to factor through some smaller piece. So let us assume that we have some subcomplex F of V such that the, my Lie derivative LV actually preserves F. Then I am exactly in the hypothesis of that abstract strange theorem I had before, the one with just an abstract Cartan square and a factorization. And I obtain something like this. So from the tone Witten of that inclusion there, I go to this L infinity algebra here, and with that linear L infinity morphism. Um, yes? Inside your definition of, in, in that top blue line, you yeah, this one. As a, as a auxiliary variable, but V was already fixed as a zero cocycle. So should I oh, no, 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 that, that is a W. That, this, this looks like a V, but it is a W. It's a, it's a W. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so I, I want to say that this is the, the morphism phi I had promised at the beginning. So, this here actually looks like the G I've talked of. This is the homotopy fiber of some inclusion. And now I have to convince you that this guy here is homotopy abelian. <laughs> <laughs> well, w w what is this, this, this guy here? Well, okay. This is just a model for something which is intrinsic, which is the double homotopy fiber of this square. And it, how do I end up with this cone of Tom Whitney going to Tom Whitney. I just start with the commutative square. I take one model for the homotopy fiber here. I take one model for the homotopy fiber here. In particular, I've chosen the Tom Whitney model in both cases. By the universal property, there is a morphism between the two. And then I take the homotopy fiber of this morphism here. So 
that cone of tone width and tone widthness is actually the double homotopy fiber of this diagram. But it is a model. It, it is only uniquely defined up to equivalence. So let me show you that there is a much simpler model for that object there. So the idea is that the homotopy fiber of the inclusion of endomorphism into affinities is just V shifted by one. Well, wh wh why is this true? Well, of course, here I have affinities, here I have linear endomorphism, and there is a piece that is missed, which is just V. But V would be here, downstairs. So when I took it as a fiber, it has a shift by minus one. So this would be a, a, an obvious statement if I were talking of chain complexes. But here I want this to be um, homotopy fiber of DGLA morphisms. So something more subtle is happening. And this is precisely what I was hinting before, that we have a split exact sequence of uh, DGLA morphisms. So here I'm taking the homotopy fiber of a section. And the, homo the homotopy fiber of a section of, uh, well, this is a fibration, is always quasi-isomorphic as a DGLA to the fiber shifted by minus one. So I, I, I need this particular diagram for things to work. Obviously, in chain complexes of a, over a, a field, this would always split. So uh, this would always be true that here I have V minus one. But to show that here I have V minus one in the context of DGLA, I need that to split as uh, a sequence of DGLAs. Okay, and now you can imagine how this is completed. So here, I I the missing piece was V, and there the missing piece is F. And so here, this cone here is the homotopy fiber of the inclusion of F into V. And again, the same story. What is on the right? I have F inside V, and here this is a vibration over V mod F. So on the left appears V mod F minus two. Uh, well, then we are done. We, uh, I just need to tell you which are the geometric ingredients now. So uh, start back with, a, I said compact. Well, uh, it was not needed compact. Uh, uh, just a complex manifold and Z some co-dimension P complex sub-manifold. Then I consider Z is a closed sub-manifold, I look at it as a current. And as a current, it will be a closed current. But I want a degree zero closed element. So I consider Z as an element in the shift uh, distributions. Z would be a, a, a closed current in degree 2P. So I shift my DX, DX are my distributions, and I take as vectors, graded vectors, or better, chain complex V, the X shifted by 2P. If I make this choice, I have a chain complex and I have a degree zero closed element inside it, which is, is just my Z. And then I take a sub-complex of this, the, uh, what is it, the P part of the Hodge filtration of currents. So I take currents of type uh, IQ with I, which is greater or equal to P. So I have F, I have V, I have a degree zero closed element into V, and, uh, and then the DGLA is L and tilde L. Well, these are the one I already showed you. One is this one, the one who controls the deformation of X, and the other one is this one, the one which controls the formations of the pair. And what I need to check is that actually this L tilde here sits inside that LV. That is that elements here kills the, the closed current Z. But once I have checked this, I am and done. I have that from the tone width on the left, I go to just this chain complex here. And all the abstract identifications I did in cohomology before just tell me 
that in cohomology, the map is just the contraction I that goes from that H0 and H1, and all the others actually, to these hypercomology groups. On the left, at the level of the formation functors, I have the Hild XZ. On the right, I have the deformation factor, which by definition, I declare to be associated with that uh, complex uh, v, v over f shifted by 2 pi minus 2, a and then I'm done. That is a morphism of derived deformation factors whose obstruction map is just I, it's just the contraction I. So I, I think I'm